next speaker is Dr. Vincent Monier, and he's going to describe his work on Maillard reaction and its contribution to aging and different metabolic processes in the body. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for sticking around. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me um, talking to, to you about our research. To some extent, this talk is out of place with a talk that ha where everything has to do with tissue regeneration. Well, I'm going to talk to you about tissue damage and aging. And not to make things worse, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to suggest to you pharmacological sit solutions or partial solutions rather than uh, regeneration. So um, the conflict of interest, um, not really directly per uh, pertinent to this research here. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you about is first some philosophical and pragmatic thoughts about aging. And I'd like to put you back in the context of reality. Uh, I will talk to you about Robert Cohn's uh, uh, experiments that are at the basis of this lecture here, which has to do with the role of the Maya reaction in advanced glycation and product formation and the biomar as, as a function of the biomarkers of aging, what can we do to delay this age-related process? And then, then a few conclusions here. I think the, the, the laser pointer is not working, right? Am I correct? Uh-oh. The, the, oh, it won't work. Okay. All right. So, so a few years ago, the uh, noted geoscientist uh, David Sinclair was presenting a slide that was looking like this, is that the story of studying stochastic mechanisms of aging, damage, is an old view of how aging should be really studied. And that he was making the point that his laboratory was much more interested in actually the topic of this conference, which is to repair. So if you're good at it, you eventually reach the stage. Everything looks fine. You get a beautiful car. Of course, it will go again, become old again. That's what we're interested in, understanding this process. But not only that, you can regenerate a number of things on that car, except for one thing. That's the body. You can patch it, but you will not be able to regenerate the whole body. I don't think this is going to work. So now, in any innovative thinking, you will say, I don't buy it, and you will do anything you can to regenerate it. So let's look at that form of damage, but let's put in there my uh, mother-in-law, Annie, she just turned 100 years old, and she defines, defies everything that all the traditional stereotypes of aging, namely that she had only a high school diploma, not high education. There's a, the more education you had, the, 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 the longer your longevity. Uh, she married at 23, had two children. She divorced at 43, sec two, so spent sort of a, most of her life on a, her own, plus minus a few lovers here and there. Uh, but one thing is certainly true, she was fiercely independent. And when I visited with her at 100, she wasn't in a, her apartment and very happy there. Just not, she was going out, she's going out was going out a few, uh, two, three times a week to a restaurant. And then she had this Epicurean lifestyle. She was uh, ordering a cocktail. Then she had a uh, red wine with a dinner, with a lunch. In the afternoon, she has one of the alcoholic extracts, or, you know, these dark brown extracts, where the point is that it's the alcohol that works and not really what is extracted. 
Then in the evening she would have a glass of wine with her dinner, and before going to bed she had a scotch. Now everything went fine until, until February 23. She was sitting at the bathroom and suddenly pushing too hard. You would expect that at age you fall in your apartment, you break your hip, then you had you bedridden and you have uh, thrombosis and pneumonia and then you die. Now, she had this immense pain in her lower back. She broke the spinal cord due to some osteoporosis and then everything sort of went downhill. She spent two, three weeks in a hospital. Surgeons didn't want to operate. And uh, so what happened is the, the, the extracellular matrix broke down, okay? So uh, that's what I want to talk to you about. So the vision of how uh, extracellular matrix, the two cycles here on the left, the green cycle, that interface with the red cycle, meaning that you have we accumulate protein damage as we age. We form more and more, le uh, less and less soluble material. We diminish a turnover. And that then interacts with the cells. And cells that are grown on age extracellular matrix have different signaling pattern. They proliferate less. They uh, detach. They undergo anoikis and so forth. So this, this is probably a very important cycle which every regeneration person should consider uh, 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 beating, uh, if at all possible. So what we've been looking at is this so-called Maya reaction, which is what happens in brown food. And indeed, the Maya reaction is under uh, intense research by food researchers, not only for the beneficial effects of the aromas, but also the change in te texture that is brought by to the food. And, but when you look at uh, extract from cartilage, you can actually measure this aging process. Right now, we're trying to elucidate the structure of the very brown product. Uh, it's a complex fluorescent molecule. We have sort of a, a, a three-quarter elements of that structure, but we're missing some elements. And then we've also been working on the aging lens here, where the big difference, you will see the chemistry that's behind that, which I would like to talk to you about. So Cohn's basic experiment, he was measuring pe pepsin solubility of skin collagen or tendons. He found a decrease as a function of age, and the insoluble collagen increased. He not only showed that in the human, but that there was a sort of an aging clock that ticked as a rate in inverse, uh, in, uh, inverse uh, uh, recipro reciprocal with the uh, 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 maximum lifespan, so that it, the clock would tick faster in the dog than in the human. So collagen became faster insoluble in the dog than the human. So that's one of the aging clock. The other one you know about is the epigenetic clock from Horvat with the methylation story of DNA. So I think there are these two clocks, one affecting the extracellular matrix and long-lived proteins, and the other one affecting DNA. And we proved this concept of the clock when we were able to isolate the first advanced Maillard reaction uh, fluorescent product and crosslink which we called pentosidine because there was a pentose molecule in it. And we showed that it accumulated faster in pig, faster in cow, faster in dog. And even the rate, you don't see it in the, in the shrew, the, uh, the, the rate component of aging is much faster. The shrew lives about two years, has a high metabolic rate. And this is, there's an inverse relationship here with the pentosidine information and the maximum lifespan shown in a uh, uh, log, log linear uh, way. And the upper curve is very similar to the one if you would plot the metabolic rate as a function of maximum lifespan, you get the same curve. So the two curves sort of overlap. So Cohn's observation 
it can be summarized as follows. The most readily observable changes occur in the extracellular matrix. He was a student of aging, and he didn't care much about C. elegans, Drosophila, and so forth. He was really interested in aging as a pathologist at our institution. The other one is that diabetes accelerates aging of the extracellular matrix. So I will show you quickly these changes. You've seen such picture already uh, 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 many times. The clock ticks faster in men than women. There's a loss of elasticity in skin. If you're diabetic, then the dark, uh, the, uh, the, the, the black dots, curves, the loss of elasticity is faster than if you're not diabetic. If you look at the lung, there's an age-related lung uh, 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 loss of elasticity in the lung. The lung is full of collagen, and when you're diabetic, the black bars, the loss of functional uh, vital capacity and the expiratory volume is worse than if you are not diabetic. When you look at the age really the change in arteries, arteries be become more stiff as a function of age throughout the entire body tree. And when you look at the, the relative, the, the, this is a relative increase in pulse wave velocity compared to control in, in, in percentage increase, you see that for every artery, if you're diabetic, the stiffness is increased compared to non-diabetic. If you look at the thickening of the basement membranes in uh, people with type 1 diabetes compared to normal, you see that there is an accelerated acceleration of this aging process. In general, diabetes accelerates aging by a factor of two to fourfold. If you look at the uh, uh, vertebral cartilage. Look at this cartilage by the age of 57 is already full of advanced glycation end products. And I showed this picture before. There's increased stiffening of, of uh, uh, the hands and the age-related risk for osteoarthritis at every age increases rapidly uh, in presence of diabetes. And then finally, the age-related loss of lens elasticity. If you are diabetic, your risk of cataract formation increases for one odds ratio all the way up to 3.6. Uh, the, wor the worse the mean glucose level is by glycated hemoglobin, the worse your loss of uh, lens elasticity. And finally, at uh, all causes of mortality, whether from cancer or non-cancer causes, cardiovascular disease, is increased in presence of diabetes and increases as a function of uh, uh, amine glycemia uh, in, the, in the blue cartoon there. So Cohen has proposed that diabetes should be regarded as a syndrome of accelerated aging. So you have the, the, the three classical syndromes which is Hutchinson, uh, uh, Hutchinson Guilford progeria, you have Werner syndrome, you have Down syndrome, and you can add diabetes as a fourth human syndrome of accelerated aging. So, what is the role of advanced glycation end product in this process? This is a simple summary of selected pathways of the Maillard reaction. The single major source of uh, chemicals is, comes from glucose. So in the extracellular matrix, it will react with proteins from fructose lysine, which is, forms the basis for hemoglobin A1C measurement. But this keeps reacting and forms a crosslink called glucosepine. I will show you that this is a single major crosslink that accumulates in the age-related uh, uh, age uh, uh, in aging. The fructose lysine can get oxidized. It forms a major modification called carboxymethylysine. There can be a fragmentation of glucose that will form a glyoxal hydroimidazolone. Or if you go intracellularly via glycolysis, you form the important methylglyoxal uh, toxic compound that is formed in every species 
uh, uh, living species, including plants, and therefore we have enzymes like glyoxalase, one that are being studied by um, uh, groups like uh, uh, Paul Thornali and, and Naila Rabani's groups. So uh, we developed a mass spectrometry assay for glucosapine, and you see this is the age-related increase, and if your diabetic levels uh, are, are becoming sky high, again, this factor of two to four fold accelerated, which most likely imparts an, uh, the, 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 the stiffening basis for uh, uh, the collagen. And the, uh, yeah, the, the red bar shows you that every one of these advanced glycation end products, starting from glucosapine, fructose lysine, uh, aminoadipic acid, carboxymethylysine, methylglyoxalhydroamethylone, MGH1, the single major modification by methylglyoxal, they all increased again in diabetes. So what happens as we age, we accumulate an AGE burden. And the question is, at one time, and it's still difficult to say which, is there a threshold where this AGE burden becomes a problem? We developed an antibody to glucosapine, and you see that in the mouse, uh, uh, APOE uh, null mouse uh, model that has a thickened intima uh, in the, the aorta, this, these experiments with Anne-Marie Schmidt at uh, New York University, you see everywhere we have this yellow color, this is where glucosapine forms. The thickened heart of these uh, mice are full of uh, glucosapine, suggesting that the more glucosapine fo you form, the lower you turn over the extracellular matrix, and therefore you contribute uh, to thickening of uh, 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 the, the intima and uh, possibly of the, the uh, ventricle, uh, increase in ventricle size too. In the human, the brown color shows you that Glucosapine forms where the uh, neo intima forms, and as well as uh, in the media, it's full of uh, uh, glucosapine crosslink. In the kidney, the blue dot shows you so the kidney membrane, as a function of age, does not increase, but in, it is increasing in, in uh, individuals with diabetes. And you see that again, the blue dots show you that uh, most of the data points are increased in the uh, GBMs of uh, a, uh, people with diabetes. So the overall concept is that glycemia relates to diabetic complications via two pathways. One, which is an AGE pathway, and the other are other stresses. When in the, our, our long-term studies with the DCCT, when we adjusted for the AGEs, the association by, from A1C and complications became much weaker. So that pathway does contribute to the formation of uh, diabetic complications. We also determined uh, the risk as a function of uh, subclinical markers, coronary artery deposition, which is shown here. These, these black dots is a staining for, uh, for coronary artery calcium the thickness of the uh, media that I was mentioning before, and the uh, uh, ventricular mass. And what's interesting now, to summarize 30 years of research with the DCCT, the AGE markers related to glycemia itself, glucose, are strongly related to diabetic retinopathy, diabetic kidney disease, and diabetic neuropathy. And those related to diabetic macrovascular disease have a different signature. There are these fluorescent compounds, the one we're working on, like LW1, and uh, also methylglyoxal hydroemesolone. So the glucose-mediated burden is related to diabetic microangiopathy, while the other pathways uh, of AG formation are related to macrovascular disease progression. 
So this is what I talk about on the left with the skin. What about the lens? The lens is a different story. The lens accumulates all the advanced glycation end products that are formed in the extracellular matrix. But there's an interesting uh, 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 variation. You see that in the skin, which is on the left, or tendons, Fructose lysine is the major modification in collagen, but not the lens. Glucosapine is a major modification in collagen, but not the lens. But the methylglyoxal hydromethazone formation is a major modification in lens, but not collagen, despite the fact that the lens has a lower level of glucose, but the lens is full of ascorbic acid vitamin C, one, two, three millimolar. And we proved that this MGH1 modification comes from vitamin C via fragmentation of ascorbic acid and formation of all these advanced glycation end product there. And we proved this in the study with these authors here. Uh, and we took advantage of the fact that the mouse lens epithelium does not pick up ascorbic acid. That's because the mouse evolved with a lens that does not need to protect itself from UV light because rodents come out at night. And they need to see the fluorescent food, the fluorescent blood, so they can get to food. So they don't have this UV filter that ascorbic acid is. So we generated a, a transgenic mouse called so, that has using the sodium vitamin C transporter 2. There are two of those. The one is in the in intestine for pickup of vitamin C. The other one in lens and brain. And we generated a mouse in which we overexpressed the vitamin C transporter in the lens. And when we did that, the levels of ascorbic acid increased in the mouse lens, including the levels of the oxidized form of ascorbic acid. That's important because that's a precursor compound of the modifications in the lens. Not only that, but within 12 months, the transgenic mouse developed the same modification color, including all the AGEs that are formed in the aging human lens. So we, we proved that through this, that the vitamin C is a major contributor. Not only that, but we then then mass spectrometry studies. We labeled, uh, used labeled ascorbic acid in the, 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 the red modifications. And we, we were able to measure the major modifier of, of MGH1 that has three uh, mass units higher, 232 instead of 229, to distinguish the endogenous form vitamins uh, MGH1 from the one coming from ascorbic acid. And in doing so, we found that the infused uh, uh, ascorbic acid led to an increase in MGH1. And then in additional studies, we measured it in the brain of patients with Alzheimer's disease. And you see all the, these data points uh, we found elevated MGH1 formation. And the reason why that's important is the neurons in close contact with astrocytes that are loaded with uh, vitamin C. So there is a, there is a uh, exchange of vitamin C between the astrocytes and the neurons. And so as soon as this redox biology is impaired, vitamin C get, gets oxidized and makes MGH1. We also found using an antibody to MGH1 that brains of patients with Parkinson's disease, all these, uh, 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 these brown dots in the neurons of these patients, and we quantitated here the level of MGH1 and found that uh, the levels in patients with uh, at, uh, Parkinson's disease were dramatically elevated. So this may contribute to the slowdown uh, and the, the increased deposition of um, uh, uh, synuclein 
for example, as one of the target uh, a protein that aggregates in the brain of patients with Alzheimer's disease. So what are the th therapeutic strategies? One would be to decrease the AG burden in the exocellular matrix, and the other one would be to slow down cataract progression uh, uh, through pharmacological means. So let's go back to Grandma Annie. So obviously, surgeons did not want to operate on her, and wherever she was, uh, the uh, uh, regenerative medicine, I don't even know if the concept existed, the fact that they would do that, it's not yet developed. But you could argue she could have received uh, uh, osteoblast or, or, or precursor cells as a way to try to regenerate her bone, uh, but this, this just did not happen. And then you have the question, would, that, would these cells really in contact with this uh, quasi 100-year-old uh, uh, bone, would, that, uh, would they take on such an age matrix? So I cannot just tell you she, she w was not unable to get back to her apartment. She went directly to a retirement facility, and that's where, where her new life is. Uh, the other problem is that, as I pointed out to there's this paper from a, a Korean group, effect of advanced glycation end products on differentiation and function of osteoblast and osteoclast. The conclusion from the study, which is sort of okay, but not a great study, AGE suppressed differentiation and function of osteoclast and osteoblast and, and physiological collagen cross-linking. It suggests that AG may induce bone fragility through low bone turnover and deterioration of bone quality. So this feeds into this concept I uh, laid out at the beginning of this uh, talk. Now the last, so the strategies would be one to lower glycemia and of course uh, exercise as we all must do. There have been anti-AG drugs that were ex uh, developed several years ago they had mixed success. They didn't reach FDA endpoints. Aminoguanidine um, would have, it, if they had redone the trial, would, uh, the, the endpoint was almost reached. So, but the trial was limited to four years, and that's just not enough time for such drugs to, to act. But there is one drug, it's metformin. Metformin can scavenge advanced glycation end products. And in this study here of metformin suppresses AGEs and methionine sulfoxide, you see CEL were lower, glyoxalhydromyrazolone, MGH1 is lower, another modification, uh, 3DGH, uh, uh, carboxymethylarginine is lower, and even oxidative stress methane, methionine sulfoxide is decreased. And then we all know, of course, the, the, the um, uh, anti-aging properties in metformin that uh, will suppress mTOR formation and so forth and favor uh, uh, autophagy. There's also one study, this is a um, uh, meta-analysis, shows that metformin reduces all-cause mortality and diseases of aging independent, um, independent of its effect on diabetes control. So that would be the ultimate cheap drug to try to slow down uh, the uh, overall aging and the glycation clock. The last two slides that I would like to present is a paper that basically just came out today in Medline on, uh, I've been collaborating with my colleague who is a uh, specialist in artificial uh, intelligence whose specialty is to do drug repositioning of FDA approved drugs. And we'll ask the question, can we find drugs that will slow down cataract that are already known? The good news is as of tonight, you can take this drug that is an over-the-counter drug. And so we know this is again, this part of lens regeneration, uh, uh, intraocular lens implant. Now the lens regeneration field, they have an, a new strategy they try. They, they suck out the sick lens they leave the capsule 
And th this will then regrow a lens or a lentoid. And so the hope is that you can use regenerative medicine to generate a lens in situ. The pharmacological option, reversal of aggregated lens protein, I don't think this will happen. Some people suggest they do have such drugs, but I think we can delay cataract formation. And the concept is this. We are all diagnosed with cataract. The first uh, light scattering species are about at the age of 60, and the mean age of cataract surgery is at age 73. During that time, vision can be really completely excellent. My own physician told me I had some opacities at the age of 50, and I still have by my, my both lenses and a, a almost 20-20 vision, a little bit worse than that. So if we can here take a drug that will delay cataract, I call this a pharmacological window, then we and National Eye Institute will be happy that we would delay by at least 10 years cataract surgery and lower of by 50% cataract extraction rate. So this is Rong Shu and her postdoc. They did, she, she, so she uses computational prediction. And the way this works, uh, there's an algorithm and she can extract from any database genes, gene ontology, um, pathways, tissue, everything, and she starts to look for associations by degree of significance. The stronger the association, the stronger the drug is a, a candidate for XYZ disease. So the findings for, from this study for cataract and I should say cataract in people with diabetes, and that's a, a genetic trick they used here, because uh, today there's no known drug that will delay cataract in the human, okay? Lots of drugs in, in animals, lots of antioxidants, but in the human there's no blueprint. So, so they had to use a different approach. Aspirin, endomethacin, acetylcysteine, theophylline, melatonin, thalidomide, ibuprofen, and so forth. So which of these now are true candidates to slow down cataract in the human with diabetes? For that, you did a study with the Trinex database, ele database electronic health records. There are now more than 100 million uh, records in this database from the United States, Canada, and some European and other countries, okay, including China. So you need two groups, an exposure group and a control group. And you, the way you do that, you do propensity matching. So in this case, they found 63,000 patients who have cataract and diabetes plus minus one of the drugs, okay? And the finding is that melatonin most robustly suppresses the relative cataract surgery risk in all patients with early cataract diagnosis. You see aspirin, ibuprofen and melatonin in people with type 1 diabetes. This is five years, 10 years, and 20 years. The, the effect of aspirin is waning. The effect of, um, of uh, uh, ibuprofen is waning. But the effect of melatonin suppresses by almost 50% the risk of cataract. If you look at people with type 2 diabetes, the same picture. Melatonin suppresses by 50% if you use hyperglycemia as a search uh, um, uh, uh, code in the electronic database, you find again that uh, uh, melatonin is the strongest suppressor of the risk of cataract extraction. And it's in, that association is uh, the same strength in both genders. While, for example, aspirin is stronger in males than females. I don't have time to present that data. So, summary and conclusions. Advanced glycation end products accumulate dramatically in the exocellular matrix with age and two to four times faster than diabetes. In multiple studies, AGEs were found to alter cell signaling properties, imparting pro-inflammatory and gro growth differentiation 
inhibitory properties to cells, including induction of apoptosis, for example. Glucose is the major source of AGEs in the extracellular matrix, while ascorbic acid is the main source in the lens and brain. AGEs are predictors of micro and macrovascular disease progression in type 1 diabetes. Uh, there's some indication it's also uh, the same thing in type 2 diabetes. Lowering glycemia is likely the overarching strategy to decrease total AGE burden. Metformin, on the one hand, and melatonin are promising strategies to slow, slow down diabetes-related systemic and local age-related disease progression. So in a nutshell, I, I have condensed for you uh, the major elements of what we know of um, at least that arm of the Maya reaction. I've not covered the many studies that look into methylglyoxal production, its role in, in, in diabetes, intrinsic role, in, and other diseases. The literature, since we've seen before, when I started in the field, there were, there were uh, 10 publications or 50 publications, and now there are 77,000 publications in the field of glycation. Thank you very much. Call them Saul Ganuth, a late colleague, participated in the DCCT. David Sell, my long-term uh, collaborator and mass spectrometrist. And then these other wonderful uh, collaborators. Shin Jung Fan is now an associate professor at uh, Augusta University. And uh, lots of other people I'm, that are not on this uh, graph. <laughs>